The Apple II GS, an awesome machine from my youth that I've never had the opportunity to own until now. The Apple II GS was released in 1986 for an introductory price of 1,000 US dollars, not including a monitor. That works out to just over $2,300 in 2020 currency. If you recall in the ADT Pro episode, I mentioned that this 2GS was an eBay find. Listed as not working, I won this whole mess of stuff uncontested with an opening bid of just $130. Never having owned one before, my experience with this system is somewhat limited. Back in grade school, there were a few of these machines in the classrooms, but they were really only ever used to run older 8-bit Apple II software and never anything GS specific. On today's agenda is recapping the mainboard and power supply, as well as replacing the Varda battery before it leaks and damages the system, like in the Amiga 3000 episode. I'll also take a look at some problematic disk drives and retrobrite the keyboard. As usual, I'll put links in the description for the parts used. Well, this thing's not going to fix itself, so let's get started. One thing I noticed right away was how thoughtfully designed this machine is. Everything clips into place, and there isn't a single screw to be removed in sight. Except for a little surface dust, the motherboard is surprisingly clean considering it's 34 years old. The system also came with an Apple SCSI controller, a 1 megabyte RAM expansion, and a Computer Eyes image capture board installed. I replaced the original RAM board with this modern 4 megabyte card from GG Labs for only $35. A quick vacuum of the case and motherboard to remove the dust is all the cleaning this system really needs. And there we go, looking good as new. A small issue I discovered is that one of the blanking plates on the back had been damaged. The plastic is super brittle and these tiny tabs are held on with a spring-loaded clip. I'll try and repair them with some super glue. I hope that holds. I'm also going to flood the center hole with glue just for added strength. Alright, that repair looks pretty good, but I'm afraid the tabs are going to break off again, so I'm not going to twist the clip on all the way. It's holding for now, so on to the next job. One reason the machine was probably listed as non-functional was because the only media it came with was this disc, and the five and a quarter inch drive wouldn't read, write, or even format a blank. The plan then is to perform the usual head cleaning and lubrication to see if that helps. There's nothing unusual about opening this drive up, but the logic board will need to come out in order to get access to the drive mechanism itself. Isopropyl alcohol in a cotton swab seem to be the accepted practice for cleaning the read-write head. White lithium grease is applied to the slide rails to make sure everything can move freely. With that done, let's see what happens. Ah, the sweet sound of Scholastic software sequentially seeking successfully. Another reason the machine wouldn't boot is because the hard drive was missing SCSI termination. A quick visit to Amazon solved that and the drive started booting. If only it could have been that easy.
Ugh, that sounds really bad. Let's open her up and see if lubricating the read right head stepper motor will help. I found out about this trick from an episode of Adrian's Digital Basement, so head over there for more detail. I applied several treatments of lubricant and power cycled the drive a number of times in between to work it in. Let's see if that helped any. Uh, it looks like the issues run deeper than that. The system will fully boot on occasion, but it throws errors more often than not. This is an old RLL drive in a SCSI enclosure, so it's probably best suited for a new life as a paperweight. Next up is the power supply. These are known to fail, sometimes spectacularly. Let's get in there and take a look. Removal is pretty straightforward, but I did have to desolder two wires connecting the PCB to the power switch. Okay, yeah, good thing we're doing this before things get any uglier. Replacing the caps is pretty straightforward work. My soldering skills are, let's say, underdeveloped, and I struggled a bit with the dried out old solder. Adding some fresh solder did help in the removal process. This supply was manufactured by Aztec, and they bent all the capacitor legs completely flush to the PCB, making it a bit of a chore to remove, so I snipped the legs off to speed the process along. Further, the lack of silkscreen on the back of the board to indicate the component locations required a bunch of flipping the board back and forth to make sure I was removing the right things. I like to mark off each replaced cap so I can tell at a glance what's been replaced next time I open this up in the future. Keeping a checklist also helps prevent mistakes. And there we go. Good for another three decades, I hope. Moving right along, the keyboard that came with this machine isn't the original 2GS unit. This is known as the Apple Extended Keyboard, and it's much more yellow than the system itself. I think a little Retrobrite is probably in order. One screw on the back needs to be removed, and everything else just clips into place. At first glance, the keys themselves are in good condition and probably just need a wipe down. Ugh, gross. I guess I was wrong about that. This calls for a deep cleaning. Each key gets a proper scrubbing with a nylon brush and dish soap in warm water. Then it's into a freshwater bath for a rinse. No one will ever see this, but I'll know. I'll remove the loose dust with the vacuum and then get in between the keys with a little more soapy water. All right, that's looking better. Before retrobriting, the front and back cover also need a thorough cleaning with soapy water. Afterwards, I'll give them a good rinse in the sink. Into the bin it goes. If this looks familiar, it's because I used this piece as part of an experiment in episode 9. While that's marinating outside, I'll get the keys dried off so the keyboard can be reassembled. Halfway done, and I like to flip the part around to equalize the sun exposure. 
I'm not sure this actually matters in the RetroBright process or not, but I figure it can't hurt. The keys are dry, so let's get this thing back together. I don't know why, but this is always the best part. In the last episode, I tested whether or not old hydrogen peroxide solution could be stored and reused. After six months and four workpieces, this tub is almost exhausted. I wasn't satisfied with this result, so I gave it a bit more time in the sun with some fresh solution the next day. And here's the final result. It's looking good, but I didn't go too crazy because the system itself is still a bit yellowed. I also gave the mouse a similar treatment. While I'm in here, I might as well recap the mainboard. It's probably not really necessary, as there's no sign of swelling or leaking. However, there is a slight issue with the video output that I'll demonstrate in a moment, and I want to rule out old caps as the cause. The through holes on this board are very tight, and not all the old solder wants to come out. As before, I added new solder to help reflow the old stuff where necessary. Make sure to check for the correct orientation of each cap. The direction of polarity seems completely arbitrary, even within a given cluster. As before, I like to mark each cap off as I go and keep a checklist. Last but not least, I need to inspect the Varda battery. Thankfully, there are no signs of leakage, which is awesome. I'm going to replace the battery with a solderless relocation kit that uses a removable battery. For this kit, you just clip off the old battery and straighten out the legs. I used some sandpaper to remove any oxidation and ensure good conductivity. The wiring included with the kit just slips on over the old battery legs. When installing, take care to make sure you get the polarity correct. Take a picture before removing the original battery if that helps. I secured the battery holder with some double-sided tape and then reinstalled the power supply over the top. And with that, we're done with today's repairs. This screen shows the video problem I mentioned earlier. On my newer RGB monitor, the video output from the 2GS appears rock solid, but on this older monitor, there's a strange sync issue at the top of the screen that persists even after the recap. Further, my video capture device has a difficult time syncing the Apple's 15kHz video output, which made recording the screen impossible for this episode. If anyone knows what might be causing this, please let me know in the comments. So initial thoughts as a new 2GS owner? Well, if you know the history of these machines, you recall that Apple was aggressively marketing the new Macintosh at the time, so the 2GS never got the attention it deserved. Which is a shame, because the machine has fantastic sound, expandability, enhanced full color graphics, and backwards compatibility, all at a lower cost. Because the old hard drive seems to have given up the ghost, I borrowed the SCSI 2 SD from the Amiga and plunked it on the back of the 2GS. Without changing a single setting on the device, I was able to install a fresh copy of GSOS and get the system back up and running in no time. For its age, the GSOS user interface is surprisingly slick and has the look and feel of a much more modern OS. It's a shame that Apple decided to cripple the machine by running the processor at only 2.8 MHz when it was capable of up to 14. The resulting performance really holds the 2GS back when compared to other 16-bit platforms of the time that were using the Motorola 68000, like the Macintosh, Amiga, and Atari ST. In some ways, I feel this machine shares more DNA with the Commodore 64 than does the Amiga. For one, the processor is a 16-bit derivative of the venerable MOS 6502. Even more, the Insonic 5503 sound chip found in the 2GS was designed by Bob Yanis, creator of the legendary SID chip.
Anyway, that's it for episode 10. I hope you enjoyed this bit and thank you all for your continued support in the early days of this channel. Stay safe out there wherever you are and we'll see you next time on Retro Bits.